is indeed an honor and a pleasure calling for our first speaker this evening, the International President, Dr. Gary Mathis. sitting around here today and I just kind of had a feeling this might be, but I'm always happy to give a testimony to the things that I have come to understand and know since being a member of this school. And I'm just happy to be here in this northern region and to see the turnout of the people that have come out for this convention. And I know uh, I saw a lot of people getting into their rooms this evening when we were coming down, so I know they're not all in here yet. So uh, we're going to have a full house. But you know, when we, what I like to do every once in a while is just get on the other side of the fence and, and kind of look back to where we came from so that we can get a better appreciation of what we have got in this school. Now. Coming into the school, we come in here, I'm going to say a few things right off the start to kind of set the, the tone. We came in here dead on arrival. Now by that I mean we had no idea of what Yahweh's purpose, plan, we didn't even know so much as to whether he had one or not. Trying to prove that there was a God, and we'd heard all of our lives that he was invisible and you couldn't see him. Uh, so you just had to take your best guess as to whether there was one or not because they hadn't offered you any proof when you come out of the organizations that are out in the world today. And all of us came out of one or another of those organizations. Now, coming in here, we hear about one Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley who received the divine vision and revelation in the year 1931. Now, we used to say that he claimed to have received a divine vision and revelation. And now I just have to tell you, he had a divine vision and revelation. It's not that he claimed it. But we've gone on, and like he said to us, you make me prove it. And he went on to do that. Now what he did, he took the things that I knew. I was in computers. So he took the computer. Dr. Harris here, he was a medical doctor. So what did he do? He put him up here and used the physical body. Now... All of us came in from something. And what he did, he just took what we knew and he applied it to a common pattern which we all have come to realize and understand is Yahweh Elohim himself. Now when we come to that realization, we, that just takes your opinion and my opinion, we've just come to realize just how much difference we make. What we thought just doesn't make any difference. What you think, just doesn't make any difference. It comes down to the thing that he received of a divine vision from, from Yahweh, and that's what we're going to have to come down to, is to realize that what we have here is of a divine nature. It's nothing that you're going to be able to check up on. You know, we, Dr. Harris said this last week. He said, we make the, um, the statement all the time, well, just go on out there and check it out. Well, I defy you to do that. And he said this, he you go in and check it out. This isn't out there in the libraries, folks. What we're talking about here is of a divine vision and revelation. You're not going to go out there and find any of this that's up here out there. You're not going to be able to prove it. You're, you're going to have to find it within your heart and within your mind. Now, that's the proof. Because they come up here and they will say statements to me like this. There was a man by the name of Farley that was raised from the dead. Well, he was near death. The doctor sitting up here is a witness to it, but I didn't see that. There was some others that were healed, healings through this one, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley that we talk about. But I was out in Los Angeles. I didn't see that. I didn't know about that. But then one day I opened up my eyes and realized that I was deaf. I couldn't hear. 
I was blind, I couldn't see, and that's what you're going to have to come to. You're going to have to realize and just humble yourself on down to this divine vision and revelation that was delivered to one Henry Clifford King. Now, you're just going to have to do that. Now, what he had within that vision or what he brought to us was that there is a divine pattern in everybody's Bible. He didn't have, you don't have to get any translations or anything special. Just take the one you've got at home on your shelf. And when he, when he, when he said that, I just brought back to remembrance that Bible that was sitting at home on my shelf. It, was, it had been there all along. Now, right away you've got problems when you start reading that Bible because that book is sealed. You can't get in that book. Now, I like to say it like this. It was written of the Spirit. It was written for the Spirit. And how does the rest of it go? And by the Spirit. Now, that's, that's the way the book is. You know, for the people and by the people and of the people. Well, that's, this is for the people or for the Spirit and of the Spirit and by the Spirit. Now, that's the way that we're going to have to come to it. And come to realize those things, it just sets you down a little bit and realize that, boy, you know, the things that we thought just don't make any difference. We just have to humble ourselves on down and say, yes, this man did. He did receive something back here. Now, whether you want to call it a vision or what, whatever you want to call it, the man received something. There wasn't any man came up and sit down and let's take Elohim, the archetype pattern of the universe, that textbook. We, we call it Doc's book or the textbook. Now, you just get into that and you try to understand it and you can't do it. It's just like this Bible. And then when you start looking into it and think, now here's a man with a sixth grade education and he put that book together and we're still reading in there and still coming up with new things. Every time you pick it up and start looking, you find something else and say, oh, did he, he knew all about that too. Yes, and, and then you look and start reading the book, Bible and take the pattern of, of the tabernacle. Now, when we take this pattern and we apply it to the scripture, now, I want to get 1 John 5, 7, and 8, and start reading down. <laughs> yeah. See, there are three that bear record in heaven. Read on. Uh-huh. See, there's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Read on. Now, these three are one. They're not three different independent things. They're these three are one. Read on, please. Now, there's three that bear witness. Where? Now, where are you? In the earth. Whether you realize it or not, you're in the earth. I mean, this, is, this that you have on here was made from the dust of the earth, and you are in the earth. But read on, please. There's three that bear witness in the earth. Read on. The spirit and the water and the blood. Now these three agree in one. Now they agree into the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, which are in heaven. Now these three agree in one. I want to read on just a bit more. Uh-huh. Now, see, if we will receive the witness of men, we can just check it out. And you can receive the witness of men. You can just testify that everything that is out there in the universe is threefold. Now, you can, you can check that out. You can find that, that there's nothing out there that isn't threefold. Everything. The way you talk, the way you think, everything is threefold. Now, read, please. Now, this is the witness of Yahweh, which he testified of his son. Now, that's, that's what he testified of his son, or of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, what you're going to have to do is go on over and find out that you're going to have to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. When Israel was told to take out a lamb down here prior to the, to the exodus, do we have any new people? Okay. That when they was told to take out a lamb down here prior to uh, uh, their departing, 
they was told to take out a lamb without spot and without blemish. Now, how are you going to take out a lamb without spot and without blemish unless you examine your lamb? So now what you have to do now is examine this lamb. Now, if you don't know anything about lambs, how are you going to examine the lamb? Are you, well, what if you just don't know a lamb's supposed to have four legs? And don't know, well, what if, you know, you're going to have to know something about the lamb before you can examine him. So you're going to have to have something to guide you to examine your lamb. You're going to have to look the lamb over and make sure there's no spots, no blemish, no broken legs. You know how we are. We'll come along here. We'll, we'll say, well, I've got to make a sacrifice of a lamb, so we'll take the one that's limping today. Because that's, that was no good to us anyway. You know, he said he wanted one without spot and without blemish. So you're going to have to try him. You're going to have to test him. You're going to have to find out, is this the one? Is this the good lamb? Is this the one without spot and without blemish? Now, when, you, when you've got that, now what he has to do, and this is why it's just mandatory upon Yahweh to give you some way to know him. John 17, 3, please. Mm -hmm. Now this is life eternal. Read on. That they might know thee. That they might know thee. Read on. The only true L. Now the only true L. Now we, you know, this is life eternal. That they might know thee. The only true L. And I'll just keep pointing up here to these illustrations because that's that's they're they're here for us to understand. Read on. And Yahshua the Messiah. Now, and Yahshua the Messiah. Repeat, please. And this is life eternal. Now, this is life eternal. See, we was always thinking of life eternal as we could go out and get water baptized, take the Lord's Supper, tithe to our, to, to our churches. And, well, you know, you all came out of one or another of these organizations out here, depending on which one you belong to as to what you had to do. But nevertheless, they was telling you that these things were essential for your soul's salvation. You had to be water baptized. You had to be uh, 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 take the Lord's suppers and just to name a few of the, of the things that they requested of us. But it says, now this is life eternal. Read on. That they might know thee. That they might know. I wanted to stop on that word. That they might know. Now, did you, did, now, let's just be honest with ourselves here for a while this evening. Coming into this organization, coming into this school, or if this happens to be your first time in this school, be honest with yourself, that they might know. Did you know, I mean know for certain, that there was ever a man that hung out there on that cross? Did you know that? Did you have evidence? Did you have the proof? You had the that you knew for a fact that this man was crucified out here on Golgotha in Jerusalem. Now you go over there and talk to the Jews in Jerusalem and stand on Golgotha and ask them, well, is this the place? We've been there. And they'll say, well, this is the traditional place. In other words, they don't even know for certain whether there was a, a, a man. And if you talk to a Jew and you start talking to him about Jesus Christ, then you just lost these, you, you lost a, a candidate right there because they know that the name isn't Jesus Christ. They know right away that, that you don't know what you're talking about when you start talking about Jesus. They're just not going to listen to you, so you might as well just stop right there because that's as far as you're going to get. Now, when we was there in Jerusalem, they looked at this chart, and it had the name of Yahweh up here on it. And the Jews recognize this as being Jewish. So that, that's, 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 the, uh, uh, that's the name in, in Hebrew. And, and, but they looked down here and saw this crucified Christ, as they called it, and they walked away. They said, no, this can't be any good. Look at this. They've got a crucified Christ down here. So, but you see, but, the, but it says, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true El, be gone. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true El, yes. and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. And they got to know Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. So it just put up, it's just a, a mandatory hurt upon Yahweh that he gives you a way 
that you, you can come to know Him. Because that's the only way that you can arrive at eternal life, is to come to know Him. Now, if He didn't provide the way, then you just don't have a chance. Every one of us are going to be in the grave one of these days, regardless of if it be uh, a few day, years or a whole bunch of years, you're going to end up there one of these days. Because you were not created in perfection, you will not live forever. So you are, you do have an appointment down the road. Now, if you do want eternal life, and that's what this is all about, then it's mandatory on you. It's not a, it's not a if you would like this or it would be nice to know. No, this is something that if you don't know, if you don't know these things, you're going to end up in hell. As they say, I'm going to just use that expression like that. And what they're telling you out in the world now is that you're going, you better be careful or you're going to die and go to hell and not realizing that you've already died and you've already gone to hell and you should be trying to find a way out. Uh, that's that's the getting down to it the way it is. But see, when he gave us a Messiah, he gave us a Savior. He gave the Savior, but he was crucified from the foundations of the world, or the kingdom was established here from the foundations of the world. Now, if he set men or a man in his creation, and he set up the the uh, or the uh, atonement right from the beginning, don't you think he knew what was going to happen when he put the man in there? So he set the man in, and he says, "Now, I've already set the Savior in the world for you. He's already established." And then he transfigured into this threefold intangible tabernacle to Moses here at Mount Sinai. And then he said, now you build it down here in the, in the wilderness of Sinai among the children of Israel. Now when they built the, tab the tabernacle down here, see now he gave Israel a Ten Commandment law. Now when they was to take this, to, to keep this law, what he did, he set up a sacrifice. So when you break the law, there's a sacrifice for righteousness. In other words, if you do, uh, if you break law number one, you've got to offer up a turtle dove. If you break law number two, you've got to offer up a bullock. And, but in other words, there was a, there was a, there was a, an atonement or a sacrifice for breaking this law. So when he gave the law, he knew he wasn't going to keep it because he'd already established a sacrifice. So that if you so when he, he, when he gave the law that it couldn't, they couldn't keep it because it was spoken from a spiritual realm down to a carnal-minded or a physically-minded people down here who just didn't have the ability to keep this law. But now what we've got to do is with, in order to, so that we can come to understand and know Yahweh, then it's going to be a mandatory requirement upon us that we come to some knowledge of Him. And what He did... He established this pattern back here in the realm of eternity when he showed Moses here in Mount Sinai and he established this pattern and he told Moses to build it down here. So he showed himself up here and then he built it down here. Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1, 19. Mm -hmm. Because that which may be known of Yahweh... Now remember, we're going to have to know... It says that which may be known. There's something we can know. Whatever it is, it may not be a whole bunch, but whatever it is, for that that may be known. Read on. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Now that's, this, that that may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Read on. For Yahweh has showed it unto See, them. See, they saw the God of Israel back here. Read on. For the invisible things of him. For from the, the invisible things of him. You've heard of this invisible God. The invisible things of him. Read on. For the invisible things of him uh -huh. from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now these invisible things are clearly seen, read on. Being understood by the things that and are made. not only are they clearly seen, but you and I can understand them. Looking at the things that are made. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. I have not anything new. Folks, there's a founder received of this divine vision and revelation, folks, and that's just been good enough. Exodus 25 and 8. Yes. And let them make me a sanctuary. Now you let them make me a sanctuary. Read on. That I may dwell among them. That I may dwell among them. Read on. According to all that I show thee. According to all that I show thee. After the pattern of the tabernacle. After the pattern of the tabernacle. See, we're talking about a pattern here. 
or this is the pattern of the tabernacle that's being mentioned there. Most holy place, holy place, court round about. Read on. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof. In other words, there were furnishings placed within this tabernacle here. And the, the we must. this is the tabernacle pattern. And Luke 11.52, please. I have to get this because everybody keeps copying my scriptures. But read on, Luke 11.52. Yes. Woe unto you lawyers. Woe unto you lawyers. Now that's the people that work with the law. That's the first five books of your Bible. Woe unto you lawyers. Read on. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Back there in the law, there's a key to knowledge. And that's what we're after. We have to know something. We have to know. We have to try our Savior. We have to get us one without spot and blemish. We have to know him. Now the key to knowledge is back in the law. That's, that's according to what we're reading in the Bible. It says... Uh, repeat, please. Woe unto you lawyers. Now that's the first five books of the Bible. The lawyers, the law. Read on. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. So you've taken away the key of knowledge. Read on. Ye entered not in yourselves. You didn't enter in yourselves. Read on. And them that were entering in, ye uh, hindered. That, the, those that were entering in, you hindered. by. So you've taken away the key of of knowledge. Now that's just what's happened. You don't have the key of knowledge out there today. You don't have the, the tabernacle pattern, the thing that will allow you to try your lamb. You can put him up here and try him. Uh, uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Now what you can do is you, uh, well, let's, let's just go on to expedite time. Uh, Isaiah, is it... Uh, 28.9. Isaiah 28 and 9. Can somebody get before that the uh, John 14 and 26. Folks, these are, these are things that are simple. These are things the founder brought to us. They're things that just... When you're, when you, it's like being hit real hard right in the stomach, and it just knocks the air out of you. You know, just you just have to lay there and get your breath back, because they've been there all the time. It's not something new. He didn't bring us something that we had to write another book about or anything. Just read the Bible, and it agrees. The vision, just just everything in that vision, just comes together. Said so he didn't have to go write a new book. He just read the same one he had, and it's the understanding that was wrong. That's what he had wrong. And he had been in the gospel or preaching of the of the gospel some 15 years in the Church of God before he received this vision and revelation. Read, please. John 14, 26. Uh -huh. But the Comforter, mm -hmm. which is the Holy Spirit. Now the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Read on. Whom the Father will send in my name. Now his name was Yahshua, whom the Comforter will send in my name. Read on. He shall teach. Now, he shall teach you all things. Now, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Now, that's the one that teaches after Pentecost. It's been the Holy Spirit all the way down. Now, a lot of people have gotten their own names involved in this thing, like Reverend Who, uh, uh, what was Reverend Doolittle? And, and some of the, the they, they get their own names mixed up in this, but see, that just takes away from it because this is Yahshua speaking right on down from uh, uh, 19 A.D. 33, right on down. It's been Yahshua. Read on. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. whom the Father will send in my name, yeah. he shall teach you all things. Now, he's going to teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. And he'll bring all things to your remembrance. Read Whatsoever on. I have said unto Whatsoever you. Whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, if he doesn't say anything to you, then isn't anything to be brought to your remembrance. So he's got to say something to you. Please, please. Peace I leave with you. No, uh, uh, next one. Isaiah. Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 28 and 9. Yes. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now whom shall he teach knowledge? Read on. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Now whom shall Yahshua teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Not He's going to teach you and he's going to make you understand it. That's what, what he said because it's the truth, folks. What is happening is he's 
establishing the foundation for the truth. And when you set the truth up, you don't have to prove it. You just, just tell them the truth. And that's all the proof that you need. The truth will just stand. And you can just shoot, take your shots at it all day long. And it's proof. The, proof, the proof is in the pudding. And the bottom line, and we hear a lot about running the lines, the bottom line is, Yahshua, he will stand. But uh, read on, please. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Read and on. whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And he's going to make you understand doctrine. Read on. Them that are weaned from the milk. Now see, you're going to have to be weaned from the milk. All the types, all the shadows, all the examples that's laid down back here in the law and in the prophecy as we're going to establish here. Read on. Them that are weaned from the milk mm -hmm. and drawn from the breast. In other words, you're weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Read on. For precept must be upon precept. See, precept must be upon precept. We established a, a precept of blood, and we've established a precept of water. Read on. Precept upon precept. And we've established the precept of spirit, and as we go on, we can show you the precept of 40 that's up here. Read on. Line upon line. Now line up this bloodline, line up the spirit line, or the, the water line, line up the spirit line, read on. Line upon line. And line up the 40 line, read on. Here a little. Here a little. And there a little. Get some out of the law and some out of the prophets. They agree. One agrees with the other. They don't disagree. Now when you've done that, see what you've done, you've, you've set up your principles here. And then when you start lining these principles up in the scripture, in the Bible, the, 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 the scripture. Now you can't change any of that. It says over in Revelation that you're just you're just going to have to leave it alone. You can't add to or take from anything that's in there. It didn't say that there wasn't going to be some different words or some interpolations. But don't take oh, don't take away from this principle of blood. You just follow it. And I was worried about all the books that were lost. And God said, "There's enough in here for you to save your soul. Just understand what you've got." Don't worry about what's lost. And I was worried about the people who wasn't going to hear all this. Like mine was the pygmies of Africa or South America. He said, you didn't create them. They're not your responsibility. Just learn it for yourself. <laughs> that, was the, that was the answer he gave me. That was Just learn it for yourself. There's enough right here to save you. That's all you should be concerned with. The rest of them are, are mine, in other words. That's, so just, just learn it for yourself. But you're going to have to know this one right here. Now, when you look at this one here, Joshua the Messiah, he established the pattern for you here, the pattern of the tabernacle, and he set the principles in, and he started with Genesis 1 and 1, and he ended up with Revelation 22 and last, and he was still executing those principles. And all the way through your scripture, you're going to have to, I said you're going to have to, so there's no other choice, there's no way to do it other than line it up. Now, when you line it up, you've got the key to line it up with. That's the key to knowledge. That's the tabernacle pattern. Now, you use that as a slide rule, and you start back in Genesis 1 and 1, and you start in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you use your pattern, and you find your principles that are in here. Now, you line up this blood principle, and that water principle, and that spirit principle, and that 40 principle, and you carry that on over here into the, the stories of the ark, and you carry that blood, that water, that spirit, that 40 principle all the way down. Now, when you get these and you line them up, and as you line the principle, line them up, come down here in the end and you find Joshua. Now, what's he going to have to do? Uh, uh, Matthew 5 and 17. Matthew 5, 17. Think about. not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, here's where Christendom just makes one tremendous mistake. They're saying he came in the world to institute water baptisms. He came in the world to institute foot washings. He came in the world to institute, you know, all these things. Now, that's, that's, that's just not what he came in for. He said he came in not to destroy the law. Why? Because he is the law. He, when you get right down to the bottom line, see, he is the law. Read on, please. I am not come to destroy, mm -hmm. but to fulfill. But to fulfill. In other words, if, if back here in the law, you saw some place where the spirit moved upon the surface of the water, 
then down on the end, you're going to have to find the spirit moving upon the surface of the waters. Now, if you don't find that, you've tried your land, he's got a spot, get rid of him. Get yourself another one and put him up here. Try this one. Now, you see, does this, this one move on the surface of the water? And, br you know, bring these principles on down here. Here's, you see there's four points of blood, four points of blood, four points of blood. How many was on him? Four points of blood. Bring the water principle on down. With the, when the, the high priest came to the labor at the age of 30, how old was he? 30. When he was, when they was anointed back here, did they, or, or washed here, did they anoint them with the holy anointing oil? Yes. How, what happened over here? The spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. So you try the lamb. The trium. See, words, you're going to have to know something about this lamb. So when you look at the principles that you've got, and that, that establishes what you're going to have to find down here on the end. And when Joshua comes in and fulfills this, like when they go straight way out of the Red Sea, uh, uh, through the Red Sea into the wilderness and stay in there for 40 years, then he's got to go straight way out of here and stay out there 40-something. And if he doesn't, then get rid of him because that was not the one. He's got a spot. He's got a blemish. Then you got to get yourself another one. You can set Buddha up there. You can set you can set them all up there. You can take the, the theory of evolution. You can put it all right up there. Look at the big thing. All of it. Put it, put it up here. You've got something to try it with. You've got the pattern of the universe. And folks, the thing that's on my mind here lately is this too. That he's not telling the world about this. It's just you. The ones that are sitting right in here. You're in such a privileged position. Every one of us should just be jumping up and down and so happy with the things that we've got. And i tell you something else. I hear him talk about this vision. You know, um, prove the vision. We go over to uh, Proverbs 28, 19. We're going over to look at Numbers 12 and 6. You know those scriptures. Let's go back and look at something in Matthew 17. And I believe it's the ninth, ninth verse. When he's here in the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew 17 and 9. Yes. And as they came down from the mountain. As they came down from the mountain. Read on. Joshua charged them, saying, uh -huh. Tell the vision to no man. What did he tell them? Tell, tell the, vision the vision to no man. He's talking about a vision back here. He says, now you tell the vision to no man until. Until the Son of Man be risen again. From the dead. Now what happens when the Son of Man is risen from the dead? You start talking about this vision. That's I mean, you, you have to start talking about the vision. He said, don't do it until I am raised from the dead. Now after he is raised from the dead, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit there on the day on in, in, uh, uh, the, the days of Pentecost, they're going to start talking about this vision. This vision. The, 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 the apostles received it there in the upper room in Jerusalem. They received of that, and they, they went on out. And when they said this is a, they, they, when they talked about this one, they talked about Joshua. They, they, they come on out and started preaching the vision of Joshua. Then you come on down to us down here now. And then there was a question asked Dr. Kinley one time about, well, who was it before 1931? Well, he wanted to know, well, who was it from A.D. 33 down to A.D. 50? Who was it from A.D. 50 down to A.D. 55? Who was it from 55 on down to 100? Who was it? You know, that's a, that they sound like, you know, those are the foolish and unlearned questions they talk about. Just avoid those things because they'll just lead you on to stri uh, 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 strife. But it was Joshua from, from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit right on down through to 1931. And when you received this vision that you have here that was established, we said, on a vision in Revelation in the year of 1931 to 1 H.C. Kinley, which, yes, it was, but nevertheless, you're going to have to identify who was that walking around here with you with this vision. Revelations 5 and 1. Revelations 5 and 1. Mm -hmm. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne uh -huh. a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven now seals. Now that's like in this Bible that you have here on your lap, that this book was sealed with seven seals. Read on. 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, uh -huh. Who is worthy to open the book uh -huh. and to loose the seals thereof? Now, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? Read on. And no man in heaven. Now, no man in heaven. Nor in earth. Nor in earth. Now, neither stop right there. No man in heaven. Now what? How does? How many does that cover? <laughs> no many and no man in heaven. That's how about the apostle Paul, Peter, James, John? Just, just how, no. They have no man in heaven or on the earth. Now that gets the Pope. That gets Billy Graham. That gets Doc. You can't even do it. It's got, it's, it's got Oliver Gill. Sorry, you can't do it. It's just not given to this. No man in heaven or no man in earth. Read on. And no man in heaven, mm -hmm. nor in earth, yes. neither under the earth. Neither under the earth. Was so able to, the, read on. Was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Okay, read on. And I wept much. Now John said he just, he wept much. Read on. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. No man was found worthy to open the book and loose the seals. Read on. And one of the elders saith unto me, mm -hmm. Weep not. Okay. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now see, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now we're getting someplace now. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Read on. The Come root on. of David. I'll point here for right now. The root of David. Read on. Has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Has prevailed thereof. to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now the root of David. That, that sounds like Joshua the Messiah. See, he came in. And he fulfilled those things. When you try your lamb, and you put him up here, and you take him according to the pattern of the tabernacle. Now, whatever you do, whatever you use, whatever tool that you've got, you're going to have to go according to the pattern of the tabernacle. Now, that's the, that's the key to knowledge right there. That's the thing that's going to try the lamb. That's the thing that's going to guide you and me. And if you don't have it that way, then it's your opinion and my opinion, and we can't get along we're going to get into fights over this thing. We're going to argue about this thing. And you're going to have arguments out here between the Baptists and the Presbyterians. and the, you, Well, you know how it's all split up all over the world. It's not just in the United States or in, in Indiana. It's all over the world. And none of them agree. None of them agree. But nevertheless, it says that it was identified this one that would come and he would have that righteous judgment or that, that, that the Joshua the Messiah. Now, when you've tried him and put him up here according to the pattern of the tabernacle, then you have proven your lamb, and what it will do, it will establish that law in your heart and in your mind. Now, when you have it established in you, Colossians 1 and 26, please. And that's what the founder worked so hard for all those years. He just struggled with us. And if you just think of the patience that he demonstrated to us and it should humble some of us down a little bit and let us understand what we're going to have to do for the babes that are just walking through the door now read on please Colossians 1 26 mm -hmm. even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations now see there was a mystery that even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations in other words that got the creative age that got the antediluvian age that got the Post Diluvian age. Read on. But now is made manifest to his son. But now, here at the at the beginning of this present age of the of Yahshua the Messiah, read on. To whom Yahweh would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery See, among what, the Gentiles. What is the riches of this glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles or among the nations? Read on. Which is the Messiah in you. Now that's the riches of the glory of this mystery which is the Messiah in you. Not out there, not coming someday. You read the bumper stickers. You check it out. What, what do you find? What do they say? Are they, he's in me. Joshua is in me on the bumper sticker. What does it say? He says, Joshua's coming. First John 4th chapter. First John 4 and 1. And then I'll be, I'll be getting down from here. Beloved, believe not every now, but beloved, believe not every spirit. Now, that's your divine right to check this thing out 
And if anybody, I don't care who it is, stands up here and tries to tell you something about Yahweh, you believe not every spirit. Believe not every spirit. Read on. But try the spirit, whether they are of Yahweh. Now you try the spirit, whether they are of Yahweh. Read on. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now that was in A.D. 90. But that was written about A.D. 90. So they got a lot of experience right now. A.D. 90. And many false prophets are going to go out, have gone out. So what, why are we surprised when we find them? You know, they're, they're out there. Have gone out. Read on. Hereby know ye the spirit of Yahweh. Now here's how you can know the spirit of Yahweh. Read on. Every spirit that confesses that Yahshua the Messiah is come in the flesh is of Yahweh. Every spirit that confesses that Yahshua the Messiah is come in the flesh is of Yahweh. Now I want to stop right there for just a minute, but keep your finger right there. How do they confess that Yahshua is come? How do you confess? I'll stand up here and I'm going to say, Joshua is come in the Spirit. I'm declaring it to you. Nope. That's not it, folks. That's not the way it's done. How do you declare it? By the actions. By the way you walk. By the way you talk. When you have taken on the Spirit of Joshua in your heart, you will walk like Joshua. You will talk like Joshua. What are you going to do? What did he do? He declared the name of the Father. What are you going to have to do? Declare the name of the Father. You're going to have to walk in that name. You can't just get up here and start using Yahweh. They're yelling at out here in the assemblies of Yahweh. But you're going to have to understand that name. You're going to have to walk in that name. There's a responsibility upon you because of that name. Now, you know they couldn't have that name because it was too sacred to utter. And it is. Folks, it's, it's, it's important that you understand that. Where we walk... Today, we are in a critical stage in this thing. You can lose your soul. You can lose your soul right now, today. It's very easy to do. But you can also save your soul today. But now, what we, we must declare that Yahshua, the Messiah, is come in the flesh. And we're not going to be able to do that by getting up here and confessing, and walking and speaking these words and then go outside the doors or where you think nobody's going to hear you and see you and cuss out the board of trustees or cuss out that guy that sat next to me that went to sleep or whatever your problem is. You just can't do that. In your patience, possess you your soul, and you're going to have to just understand where these people are. If you have a baby and he's only so big and he wets his pants, you say, well, that's okay, we'll change him this time. But when he gets that big, and he wets his pants, what do you do? You take the stick out and you you show, you show him that he's not supposed to do that. In other words, you understand. You, you, in other words, you've got to be as, what does it say, as, as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove with this thing because now you do have within your power the, gra the possible possibility to kill someone in the gospel. Yes, you do. You don't go out here and just kill someone by saying you're dead. You use a weapon. You have to use a weapon. Now, when you've got the weapon right now that you can kill someone, in other words, now just be careful that you don't do that because, folks, we are at a critical time. We're at a time when we just got to bear down on this thing. We've got to understand what it is walking in us. Understand where you are and who you are. Someone to say that I am Yahweh, well, so what? What have you said? There's no way. This is inscrutable and uncomprehensible. That's a good place to be. Nobody can say, look at you and say, you're doing anything if you are Yahweh. But now when you see that Yahweh moved on into this superincorporeal form, fulfilled the law, fulfilled the prophecy, and now is challenging you to confess Him. I mean, through your every action, through every word, you've understood and you know that He did fulfill the law. It is in you. You walk confirmed. You're not doubtful. You're not saying, am I saved? You know you are. Now, that's where we are. And, folks, we're going to have to come to that, and we're going to have to come to it by the teaching, by the thing, by the pattern, by the, the vision that was given to our founder down here in the end of this age. We're going to have to realize who that was walking. 
before we can ever understand it in us. We just have to understand it in Him, and then we can come to an understanding of what it is walking in us. Now, folks, when we, um, did I have you reading? Please. And every spirit that confesses not that Yahshua Messiah is come in the flesh now, is could, not of Yahweh. If you confess not that Yahshua the Messiah is come in the flesh, you are not of Yahweh. Now, it's just as simple as that. You can read over in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, about the 19th verse, what the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit are. If we want to read them, we can read them. If I'd suggest you just read them tonight when you get up to the room and just check these things out. Because so it doesn't say that these are the spiritual application of these fruits. It says these are the fruits of the flesh. And when you start reading down, every one of them is going to be familiar with. Every one of them is going to be familiar with. You're not going to have to look up one of them. I think they're going to be pretty familiar with it. So, folks, we have got the key. We do have it. You're the privileged people in the end of this age. Now, we're going to have to be in the ark. We can't be getting in the ark when the people back here with Noah, see, they had to be in it. They were in there seven days before it rained. Now, they, they couldn't. The ones that was outside, Yahweh shut the door. Now, when he shut the door, if it had been you and me or Noah, when the people started screaming out there, we'd have opened the door. But no, Yahweh closed the door. Now, when he closes the door on this age, it's closed. Now, then it's just too late for you and I to say, well, Boy, I knew I was going to do that tomorrow, but I just didn't, you know, I just didn't get around to doing that. I was going to tell that guy I was sorry, I, you know, I just didn't, didn't mean to cut him out like that. But whatever it is, but folks, what we're saying is that we're down to the end of the age, and we have to get our act together. We do have a gospel here that will take this thing out. I mean, it is the judgment of the world. It has gone around the world. We've, we've set this up. In the Vatican, we set this thing up in uh, World Council of Churches. We set it up in Russia. We've talked about it in India. We've, we've had it all over the world, and we've talked about this gospel. Now, we knew when we went out there with it that it wasn't going to save the world, that it was going to be preached as a witness. We knew that. And that's all you're doing here in Indianapolis. Just one more time, we just preach it as a witness, for or against whichever way. And then we're down to the point in time now where Yahshua said just, you know, and you just go into the house and you just preach it the way it is and then just shake the dust off your shoes and you go on to the next house. Going over to Revelation 22 and I think it's uh, almost down to the, to the end where it says we're down to the point now where it's left the unrighteous do the unrighteous do. If you can find that for me, read it. Revelation 22. Okay. He that is unjust, mm -hmm. let him be unjust still. Now, he that is unjust, see, we haven't got time to be uh, uh, spoon feeding and one has it. He that is unjust, he's just going to be unjust still. Read on. And he which is filthy, uh -huh. let him be filthy still. He that is filthy, just let him be filthy still. Read on. And he that is righteous, uh -huh. let him be righteous Now, if you've got a righteous one, just rejoice and let him be righteous still. So read on. And he that is holy, he let, that him is holy. Be, let him be holy. Still. Let him be holy still. In other words, we're down to the end of the age. We're down to the point where there isn't any time left. And then it's, it's over. And it just hasn't been made manifest yet. So we're down to that point where it says, hey, the, the, just let that unrighteous be unrighteous still. Preach it. Give it to them just like it is. Don't sugarcoat it. It doesn't have to be sugarcoated. You've got the truth. Preach it and stand proud in it. Proud in it. You don't have to be answering to nobody. You know, except Yahweh or Yahshua. You're going to have to answer to him. And down the road. And if we haven't stood in the gospel, if we stand confessing to be in the Holy Spirit, and go out here and misrepresent him. That is blasphemy, folks. And that is there. There, there is no sacrifice for that. That is the sin unto death, and you will find out very shortly just how serious that offense is. So, folks, we do have the best thing there is going out here in the world today. So let us all walk in it and be 
be proud of what we have got and walk in it as if we all understand. So walk, just, just let your, you have a right to stick your chest out. You have a right to brand in this gospel because you are in the truth. Thank you. calling for our second speaker this at this time it is an honor and a pleasure calling for our second speaker this evening the international vice president and dean dr robert Harris. I'm indeed happy to be here at the Northern Regional Convention in 1989. <coughs> I attended the Eastern Regional Convention in uh, Richmond, Virginia. They had a most successful convention. There were about some 600 people in attendance there. And there were quite a number of visitors. And of course that is the reason that we come together is to try to reach out onto the world to bring others into the fold as you have come into the fold. And we also attended the Southern Regional Convention in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And there were some 1,682 persons at that convention. And we are all blessed to have an increase here at this Northern Regional Convention. And very soon now, the August 28th, the Western Regional Convention will be meeting in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm sure that uh, <coughs> there will be an increase also there. So we have experienced a, an increase in our organization since our founder took off the flesh in 1976. In fact, <coughs> I think Tomorrow is the 9th, is it, of August? Of, uh, not Today is the 9th? Good, okay. So this day marks exactly 13 and a half years since our founder's death. February the 9th, 1976. Now, at the time that he died, and prior to the time that he died, he said this, that we didn't know whether he would be taken off the flesh prior to the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah from heaven. We all tried to... And we go in the book and look up Matthew 28, 19, where he says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. See? So we said, now, he's going to be right with us, right on down to the end. See? <clears throat> and then others of us would look at Messiah taking off the flesh there on the cross prior to the end of that age, which occurred 
A.D. 33 when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jews up there at Jerusalem. See, so some would argue one way and some would argue the other way, you see. But it occurred that he did take off the flesh as of February the 9th, 1976. And he said <clears throat> that when he did go, that it would just only be a short time before we would be following after him, you see. And seeing now that it's been some 13 and a half years, we just ought to reason that we cannot continue to go on as we are going on. In other words, I doubt very seriously whether there would be another 13 and a half years transpire before the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah from heaven. In fact, if you check out the chronology that he's brought to us concerning the 6,000 year reign that man has been on the face of the earth, compared with the ages and dispensations, you'd find out that we only have seven years to go prior to the time that the man would have fulfilled his working six days as the creator worked six days in bringing in the creation and realizing that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day and knowing that the man is not quite as strong as the creator hmm, you see <laughs> And it says he's worked 5,993 years. And Messiah said that he'd cut that time short. Then we just all must know that this end could come upon us almost at any time. Mm -hmm. See, you don't have no guarantee that you're going to get through this convention that you're having here now. And we ought to live momentarily as if we are expecting Yahshua the Messiah to be revealed from heaven almost any instant. See? See? Now you know, I recall as a child, uh, my mother would go to work, and leave us kids there at home, and then she uh, would have given us some instructions about what we should do. And you know how kids are, you go along and you wouldn't do what she told you to do until you looked and saw her coming down the road, you see? And then you get in a big hurry to do whatever it was that she told you to do, see? Because you know if you hadn't done it, then she's going to give you a good spanking, you understand? See, so what I'm trying to point out, if you see that the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah is right upon us, you won't be out here acting the clown. You see, you be about the business of getting yourself straight now you see so then seeing that that end is right upon us then it just makes you think about what a uh, a perilous situation that we are in now you see and i hope that each one of you in your own heart and in your mind recognize and realize that you personally and individually are ready for the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah from heaven. See? Not getting ready, as it says there in Peter, you see. You understand? See? I mean, not, not getting ready, as some of us might say, but as Peter said, ready to be revealed in the last day. You understand? We should be, as of now, ready for his appearing. Now, I'm going to assume that there are visitors here. I think it ought to be announced at each one of these classes prior to calling on the speaker that you do have visitors here so that that speaker can know how to conduct himself upon this floor. Because our first pri priority when we are speaking is to take in consideration anybody that might be new among us, you see. And then if you find out there aren't any new people, then you can get on down to speaking you see, uh, things that might be helpful to uh, those of us who have been around for a while. 
but I'm going to assume that there are visitors here and just try to point out some of the basic things concerning this teaching. Dr. Gill, could I ask just how much time do I have? Oh, no, okay. Now this vision that our founder had, <clears throat> when he received it, and keep in mind that he was a minister in the Church of God for some 15 years, in the Church of God, people were people that were looked at as being those that were strict in their adherence to religious principles, you see. So they were no fly-by-night group, you see. And you think about that man being exercised in the religious teaching that they have out there in the world today. In other words, he was water baptizing people. They were eating large suppers. They were trying to follow the golden rule, you see, trying to lead a good Christian life and such things like that. And then for that man, after 15 years of that, being exercised in the teachings of the world, see, and himself being an assistant pastor there in the church of God, and having a reputation among his peers as being one of them best, you see. And the man also being a bibliomaniac, meaning that he knew that Bible from cover to cover. He could recite whole passages of that Bible, see, just by memory, see. And you think about somebody like that, see, and seeing that the Creator would take a man like that and then show him through revelation how he was wrong, you see. And I don't mean wrong about some things, but wrong about everything. In other words, what he received that in that divine vision and revelation, it completely revolutionized his thinking about how the Creator is, how he is to be worshipped, see, how he wants us to honor and respect him and to worship him, you see. And after he had received this stupendous and panoramic divine vision and revelation, then he was also advised that we would have to go to the whole world and, in other words, teach the world what the Creator had given him. See, he knew right from the beginning would be a arduous task, you see, because as the prophets of old, see, when they would be called by the Spirit, see, they knew that the people didn't want to hear what they had to tell them, you understand? See? And when they would go on to them, the people would say, well, here comes that old Isaiah. Here comes that old Jeremiah, see? And we know that he ain't going to tell us nothing we want to hear. He's always bringing to us something that is uh, uh, of uh, doom and gloom and so forth and so on, see? And they were called doomsday prophets. That's what they were called, see? And what the people would do, because they didn't want to hear what they had to say, they would take it out on the prophets, you see? And they would slay them, kill them, put them in prison, put them in dungeons, and what have you, see? And no man in his right mind would have wanted to, to have been a prophet of Yahweh or of God at that time, knowing what he had to go up against, you see? You understand? And I'd have you to know that the times are not changed, you see? You don't, you're not in your right mind if you want, if you would just want to be one of these ministers that Yahweh is called, you see? Because the, the people will do the same thing to you today that they did before, you see? And I've oftentimes said this is not no popularity contest, you see? Now the Billy Grimm's and Oral Roberts and the others out there in the world, they are highly respected by the world. People look up to them and so forth and so on, you see? 
and they are really not true prophets of, the, of Yahweh because if they were, they wouldn't have that respectability out there, you see, that they have, see? And they wouldn't be riding around in Cadillacs and wearing $800, $900 suits, see, and have a mansion to live in and all like that because that wasn't the way that it was, you see? Now, Kennedy knew that when he would go to the people, with this that Yahweh had given him, he knew exactly what they were going to do with him and, and what they would uh, actually uh, have to say to him regarding this work that he had sent, that Yahweh had uh, given him. But he took upon himself the responsibility of bringing this unto us, you see. And that man, see, he could have been a rich man, you see, understand? A multimillionaire, but rather than to accept monetary reward for this teaching, see, he just chose rather to live as a pauper, see? And when he died, he didn't have no more and, and probably a whole lot less than any ordinary man that you have out there in the world, you see? And he never received a penny for bringing this truth and this understanding to us. See? Now, the basic principle that he brought unto us was simply this. And I'd have you to know, before I go into this thing, that Yahweh, in his infinite wisdom and understanding, he knew how to break himself down and make himself understandable unto a physical or natural creature. You understand? See? And you shouldn't ever think that the things that we express down here are beyond your ability to comprehend. Yahweh endowed you right from the beginning with enough common sense, you see? You don't have to go to college, you see, to be able to understand the things that we speak of down here. Because he made it just as simple as A, B, C, R, 1, 2, 3. And it is just that simple. Now, what the Creator did, see, in showing himself unto Moses and others' witnesses, see, we have him pictured up here on this chart as a cloud, see. And we said to you that this cloud goes all around the edges of this chart, and everything on the chart is within the cloud to show that everything in the creation abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh, see? That's showing the creator in his omnipresence, you see? He's omnipresent, see? Meaning that you live and move and have your being within him. Now, we can't know him in this state of pure spirit, see? He's indiscernible, incomprehensible, and inscrutable. Now, what he did in order to make himself known unto his creatures, knowing that he was going to demand of each one of us to know him as he really is and as he actually exists. That's our first aim. In order that we might have eternal life. You see? Now the time has passed for us to think that we're going to go to heaven on emotionalism and a good feeling such things like that. Uh-uh. That won't make it at all. See? The only way you're going to uh, reach the kingdom or have eternal glorification in the kingdom of heaven is through a knowledge and an understanding of your creator. In other words, you're going to have to know something. See? Not no guessing, no speculation or anything like that. You're going to have to know something. See? So what he did was he took on a shape and form right out of this pure spirit substance, which is himself, you see, and made himself visible to witnesses that he had chosen. Now, every, not everybody saw this shape and form, see. Now, it was to Moses, and to Moses alone that he revealed himself in this form and then transformed into this threefold intangible tabernacle, you see? And you find it oftentimes say over there in the 12th chapter of Numbers 
where we read there that uh, <clears throat> he uh, said he would make himself known unto a man in the vision and speak unto him in a dream. Then he goes on to tell you in the very next verse, he said, My servant Moses is not so. Unto him will I speak apparently as face to face. See, in other words, he made a special case out of Moses. You see? Now, he chose to do that. It wasn't Moses' choice at all. See? So there are some things that Yahweh will show unto others that he might not show unto somebody else. You see? For instance, Kenley had a panoramic divine vision of Revelation. See? Yahweh chose to show him the whole purpose from start to finish, and there hadn't been a man on the face of the earth that has seen what Dr. Kennedy saw in his divine vision and revelations. He made a special case out of Kennedy, you see. But now when he took on this Satan farm and showed himself unto Moses in that farm, he knew that Moses didn't understand how he was made up and how he operates in that farm. So what he did was instantaneously transform into a threefold intangible tabernacle. Now, you've got a picture of that tabernacle <clears throat> right here, having a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. Now, threefold tabernacle, but yet one tabernacle, to witness to the threefoldness of the Godhead, the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet one Godhead, you see? Then also he showed Moses that this tabernacle was furnished throughout with these various furnishings, such as in the court round about, the altar of, in, of, the, of sin sacrifice, the brazen labor that contained water, and the cup of holy anointing oil. Then you go through a door into the holy place, and here you have the seven branch lampstand, the uh, golden table of shoe bread, and the golden altar of incense, then you go through another blue, purple, or scarlet veil on into the most holy place where you had the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim of glory on either side and the mercy seat. And this is all made of one piece, see? Now you have three furnishings here in the court round about, three in the holy place, and a three in one in the most holy place. You count them up and you have nine furnishings in all, three, six, nine, furnishings that make, make up, that are laid down in that tabernacle. Now that's the witness to the fact that in this bodily shape and form, see, firstly it's threefold according to the makeup of this tabernacle, and then in this bodily shape and form, see, could, that could only be seen in visions and understood in Revelation, you've got these nine spiritual attributes that are laid down in this form, see. Now, those eight attributes are out here in pure spirit, but they are disorganized, see, and really they are inscrutable and incomprehensible, so you couldn't know anything about their presence there. It was only after they took on a shape and form in this bodily manifestations that you could really know about their presence. Now, in this form here, intelligence assumes the superior position, flanked by wisdom and knowledge. That's up in the head region. Then further on down, you have beauty, love, and justice in the chest region. And then on down, foundation, power, and strength. Those nine divine attributes make up this bodily shape and form. And they are witnessed in the tabernacle through uh, by these nine furnishings. Now, Moses was shown this form there in the mount. You find that in the Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Let's have you read there his description of that uh, superincorporeal form. Exodus 24, 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. Now this is what they saw. Read. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. Read on. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Now this is clearly a heavenly body. That's what that expression means. See? Body of heaven in its clearly in clearness. It means it was clearly a heavenly body. You wouldn't mistake that body for a body like you and I have. 
You understand? See? I said that because some have said, well, that means that you could see through it, that it was transparent. No, that's not what it meant. It meant that it was clearly a heavenly body. See? It outshone the noonday sun. See? It was glorious in its appearance. Read on. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands. Now, he speaks about him having hands and feet, you see, and so forth and so on, and a body. See, so that's a spirit embodiment. That's not a physical body. Now, he later on went on to transform instantaneously into this threefold intangible tabernacle and tells Moses that he wants him to go down in the wilderness of Sinai and build a tabernacle there in the wilderness just like the one that he saw up there in the mountain. Give me Exodus 25, 8 and 9. Exodus 25 and 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Now he tells Moses that he wants him to build a tabernacle here in the wilderness just like the one that he saw up there in the mount. And he tells Moses that that is a pattern, you see. Now if this tabernacle is a pattern, say, then it means that this farm here is a pattern also because he just change into this tabernacle right out of this spirit embodiment. So if this is a pattern, this is a pattern too. But this is Elohim, the archetype or original pattern of the universe. This bodily shape and form is, you see. And this pattern of the tabernacle is one that is more simplified so that you and I will be able to understand how it operates and how it is actually is made. Now he goes on to show Moses, before he lets him out of that mount to build a tabernacle here in the wilderness, he shows Moses how he had made the heavens and the earth and everything that therein is according to the fashion of himself, you see, himself being the archetype or original pattern. See? Now, there's a rhyme and reason why he showed Moses that, because he wants Moses to understand that everything in the creation is reflecting the creator. See? Now, that's important knowledge, whether you realize it or not. Remember now, we said that he's charging every one of us to know him as he really is and as he actually exists. And what he's doing is making Everything that we will ever look at in this universe, including ourselves, he is making it all according to the fashion of himself, see, so that we can understand and come to a knowledge of him, you see. And when you think about it, see, your sojourn here on earth for some 70 odd years or more, see, and ever since you come out of your mother's womb, you've been looking out upon this creation, looking at yourself and looking at all the various modes of the creation, see? But without this key, which is the tabernacle pattern, we didn't know what it was we were looking at, did we? See, we looked at a man, see? And even though we had read the expression in the book there that he's made in the likeness and image of God, Nobody had ever told us how he's made in the likeness and image of God. If you ask one of these preachers out here, what would they tell you? Well, he's made the likeness and image of God after the inner man. And he know good and well. He never saw the, the inner man in his life. You understand? See? That was just an evasive way, you see, of avoiding the, the question. See? So now, this was a means that the Creator is using to show forth of himself, see? And David put it like this so beautifully. He said that the heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmness showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth forth what? Knowledge. See, the creation has been uh, 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 exhibiting and showing forth knowledge ever since we've been in it. But we just didn't know what it was that we were looking at, see? Until the, we got this key, as Dr. Gary Mathis told you, you see? Which is the thing that we have to use to unlock the mysteries of Yahweh. Now give me Hebrews 8 and 5. 
Hebrews 8 and 5. Mm -hmm. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now, I guess to show you that this pattern is important. Here, Paul is way over here in Hebrews in the so-called New Testament, because some might argue, well, you read now the book of Exodus, that's the Old Testament, and we are living in the New Testament age, see? So we ain't talking about no Moses or no tabernacle pattern, but here Paul is over there in the New Testament, so-called, see? And he's telling you that these things that were shown unto Moses serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. See, now you can't see heavenly or spiritual things, you see. You are limited by virtue of your five finite senses, you see. Now the Creator knew that. So the way that he's going to impart knowledge unto you is to make everything physical and natural, see, according to a distinct pattern, which is himself, see, and get you to look at the physical thing in order to come to a knowledge and understanding of the heavenly or the spiritual or the invisible thing. Do you understand that? You see? That's why he is making himself known unto his creation. See? Now Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of Yahweh... Now, he's telling you right there, and there's those few words, that it is possible for you to know something about Yahweh. See? You understand? And we've already shown you that you must know something in order to inherit eternal life. Dr. Gary Matthews has already been over it. 17th chapter of John. See? And this is life eternal that they might know that thou only art the true El, and you are also Yahshua the Messiah, whom he has sent. And he laid stress on the fact that you got to know it. Not guess, not speculate, not imagine, not think, but know. See, there's a lot of difference there, you see. Read on. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is see? manifest <laughs> in them. And I like that statement there, you see. Because even though it's manifest out here in the world, as I've already told you, see, and all around you, some of us will still try to alibi and make an, an excuse, mm -hmm. you see. So the, through Yahweh's infinite wisdom, this is what he did. He put it right on you, <laughs> see. Made you threefold after the tabernacle pattern. Here you are. That's why we put this right alongside of your body here, see. And if you deny this, then you deny yourself. You understand? Because you've got a head cavity, see, that is your most holy place. You've got a chest cavity that is your holy place. And you've got an abdominal cavity, which is your court round about. You see? Now, you are threefold, see? Head cavity, chest cavity, abdominal cavity. Just like the tabernacle is most holy place, holy place, court round about. Just like the Godhead is the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, see? And since the tabernacle is one, see? You are one, then that makes the Godhead one, see? Understand? And right there, you've got something right there that actually goes against the teachings out there in the world. The Roman Catholics, some 850 million of them, said that there are three separate individual personalities in the Godhead. The Father is one personality. The Word of Son is another personality. And the Holy Spirit is another personality. See? And they make these three, three, not one. Now that is a tenet of their teaching. See? Whereas everything that the Creator has made disputes that. You see? Now, if you can look at yourself and say that you are three individuals, then you can go along with them. You see? You understand? But you know you're just one individual, even though you are made up of spirit, soul, and body. First Thessalonians 5, 23. Paul says, I pray that your whole spirit, 
soul and body might be blameless until the appearing of our Savior. Read it so they'll know that it's there. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. Read. And the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. Mm -hmm. And I pray, Yahweh, your whole spirit. Your whole spirit. And soul. And soul. And body. And body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Now you see that? Now, not only are you threefold in your makeup, see? But like as we explained to you that these furnishings in the tabernacle here pointed to those attributes that make up this spirit embodiment, see, and that those attributes came out of sp pure spirit, which is Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, you see, see, then you must have organs in your physical body to correlate with the furnishings in the tabernacle, which show forth the attributes in the body of Yahweh Elohim. See? In other words, your very makeup, folks, is patterned after this tabernacle. See? You couldn't be what you are in that physical manifestation without you witnessing unto the Creator in your makeup. You see? See? So Paul is talking over there in Romans 1, 19 and 20. He said, for that which may be known of Yahweh, Yahweh has what? Because that which may be known of Yahweh mm -hmm. is manifest in them. Is manifested in them, see? For see? Yahweh has showed it unto them. For Yahweh has showed it unto them. You see, have you, have you seen yourself lately? <laughs> <laughs> see, yeah. you know how we like love to look in the mirror, see? <laughs> so I know you, Yahweh shown it unto you because you you've been looking at yourself. <laughs> If you haven't been looking at yourself, you're looking at somebody else, you see. So Yahweh has shown it unto them. Read. For the invisible things of him. Now he's invisible in this state, in the state of pure spirit, and really as the Holy Spirit. You see, in his threefold makeup, the Father is spirit, the Word of Son is spirit, and the Holy Spirit is spirit. You understand? So you couldn't know anything about him, you see without him manifesting himself in a physical manifestation and showing it unto you, see, through that means. Read. For the invisible things of him... For the, the invisible things of him... From the creation of the world... From the creation of the world. And Dr. Kennedy used to say this all the time. It was just absolutely necessary for Saul to say from the creation of the world. Because he knew that Yahweh... Elohim made the creation, you see, to witness unto himself. And therefore, he brings in that expression from the creation of the world. Read. From the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, they are clearly seen. And I tell you the truth, when you understand this thing here, you understand the way this goes, there is no haziness about your understanding. You're not, you're not confused, see? There are times when people call me up and say, well, Dr. Harris, I'm confused. Well, what are you confused about? <laughs> Where does the confusion come in? <laughs> See? You were confused before you came into this teaching. Uh -huh. See? And it's through this teaching that you become, let me use this term, unconfused. Right, 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 right. See? <laughs> now, if you're still yet confused, you'll tell it on yourself. See? This is the way we unconfuse you down here is through the simplicity of this teaching. See? Read. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are clearly seen. Not hazily or muddily seen, but clearly seen. Read. Being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by the things that are made. Well, maybe we better stop and find out what was made. He made a whole creation. From start to finish, and everything he made was fashioned after the pattern, which is himself. You see? Dr. Kennedy said, you, you, you should explain that like this, too. See? The, par the parable of the prodigal son. See? And it says there that he gave all, the father gave him his substance, you see? He asked his father for all his substance, and it said the son used his substance, all the substance that he gave him, 
in riotous living. See? And what that meant was simply this, that he just took all the substance that the Creator gave him and just went bankrupt. You see, he made the sun, moon, and stars. See? Made the animal kingdom. See? Made the ornithological kingdom. And just everything he created, you see, he made it, you see, see, and just went bankrupt doing it. You understand? See? So then, when he did that, then he found himself, you see, down here among the swine in this physical manifestation. You see? Read on. Even his eternal power and supernal nature. Now, you can understand his eternal power, see? And we better stop and explain that, see? Because we, when you talk about his power, see? And the, even nature teaches us that, uh, uh, this, see? It didn't take uh, as much power to come down out of pure spirit into superincorporealization and on down into the flesh. See, because nature teaches you that is easy to jump off of a 10-story building, isn't it? You see? Mm -hmm. You try it sometime. You see? <laughs> it's real easy, you see? You see? <laughs> but try jumping up to the 10th floor from the ground. Now, that's where the power is manifested. You understand? See? So then it was easy for him to come down, but the difficulty was to go back up. See? And it takes eternal power. And right today, that eternal power is being manifested when through the preaching of the gospel, you are raised from the dead, sitting right on your seat. See? And I tell you, it takes much more power to do that than it does to put one of these spaceships out there in the heaven, one of them up the other day. You understand? And you see all of that firepower underneath that ship as it goes up. See? You understand? But that's nothing to compare, to be compared with the power that it takes to raise a man from carnality to spirituality. Mm -hmm. See? Nothing like one. Now, when you're raised from the dead, see, sitting right here on your seat, now you talking about power. That's real power, you see? Read. So that they are without excuse. Now, you don't have no excuse, you see? And look, I'll tell you right now, Yahweh is not accepting any. There ain't no need to give you alibi and make excuses. Uh, no kind of way. Cause he not, and you know, we can come up with all kinds of excuses, mm -hmm. you see. But he's not accepting any, you see. You understand? Now, that's the key point of this teaching, is that we have a pattern, see. And the next thing about this is that it works. You see? We just don't present you with a pattern and then that's all there is to it, see. This chart here called the elementary chart is nothing more than a pattern applied to the various biblical stories that you have from Genesis on down to Revelation, you see? And we do have a 40-foot chart, you see? That we have 40 plates, see? And all of them, see, are nothing more than just your Bible in pictorial form operating and working according to this threefold pattern, you see? That was given unto Moses, you see? And we can take this thing and show you how each one of these plates, you see, shows blood here along this line, see? In one or another manifestation. That all along from Genesis to Revelation, you have water, you see? Displayed along this line, see? And along this line, spirit. And along this line, 40. Now, for the sake of our visitors, i just give you a couple examples. See? Now, here your pattern calls for blood here on the altar. The sacrificial animal was killed, and the blood had to put or be placed on the four horns of the altar. Right? See? Now, here the children of Israel are down here in Egypt. See? They're in bondage to Pharaoh. See? Now, before they can come up out of there, they had to slay that lamb, just like a sacrificial lamb was, uh, uh, animal was sacrificed here. And the blood had to be put on the top of the door, the two side posts of the door, and they had a basin of blood at the bottom of the door. Four points of blood, four points of blood, four horns of the altar on which blood had to be placed, and here are the four sides of the door where blood was located. Now, all of these types of shadows are pointing to 
Yahshua the Messiah. See? And that's the reason why when he was hung out there on the cross, he had to have a crown of thorns on his head that brought forth blood. He had to have nail prints in his right hand that brought forth blood. And nail prints in his left hand that brought forth blood. blood and nail prints in his feet that brought forth blood. So four points of blood, head, two hands, and the feet. You understand? And he said, I am the door. You see? This was a door down here in Egypt, see? Now then, as that land was offered up down there at night, then you see why it had to turn dark over the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour when he was offered up there on the cross. You understand? See? But I'm trying to show you how this story dealing with the liberation of the children of Israel up out of Egypt is going according to this pattern. Blood, blood, see? Now, next thing you come to in the pattern is water, you see? Now, it shouldn't be no mystery to you how, why the children of Israel had to leave out of Egypt and then go to the Red Sea. Why? Because you're following the pattern. The high priest went from the altar to the labor, you see? Then the next thing, the high priest had this holy anointing oil poured on top of his head, which symbolized spirit. So the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt, they had to have that cloud leading the way. And that was Yahweh Elohim in that cloud leading them up out of the Egypt. So blood, water, spirit. Blood, water, spirit. You see? And the Messiah, see, offered up there on the cross, see, Blood, see? He had to be baptized of John, water, and John had to see the a dove, the spirit, in the bodily shape and form of a dove, light on his head. So that dove symbolized spirit, blood, you see? Now then, when they get into the holy place, you always find 440 or 4,000 represented here. See, because that's the fourth step in your tabernacle pattern. The gate is one, the altar is two, three, and when you strike right here at the door, that's four. See? Holy place is five, the veil is six, and then seven. See? The most holy place. So there are seven steps in your tabernacle. So anytime you come into this middle compartment of the, of the, of the tabernacle pattern, you got four or forty represented. See? Now, let's, let's look at that. See, you talk about the fourth branch on the candlestick. That's a four. This uh, table had four rings on it. You understand? See? And this table, this uh, Ark of the Covenant here, had four ingredients that made up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the incense, you see? So four, 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 see? So four is always represented there, see? Now, you can see then why that the Savior, having been that sacrificial lamb that he offered up, and having been baptized of John, had the Spirit light on his head, then where did he go? Into the wilderness, you see, of Judea, where he was tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, you see. Now, the children of Israel, after they had passed through the Red Sea, then they went into the wilderness of Sinai, see, where they were carrying there for 40 years, you see. See, so it works. Blood, water, spirit, 40. Blood, water, spirit, 40. Blood, water, spirit, 40. And so all the way down through your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And by the way, you don't know of any minister anywhere that's been able to take that Bible and set it up according to a pattern which is stipulated in the Bible itself and then show how it works from A to Z. You see? You haven't seen nobody been, a, been able to do that. Nowhere. You understand? See? Now that's what this man, see, received in this divine vision and revelation. So it works. See? And it works on you, too. You understand? See? Let's look at a child being born into the world. See? See? When the mother and father come together, see, the sperm enters in through her parts, you see, her female parts, goes on up into the body of the womb, you see, then on up into the upper regions of the fallopian tubes, see. I'm in my field now, medicine, you see. 
You understand? See? And those fallopian tubes overshadow the womb, you see, on either side. Just like these archangels' wings overshadowed the mercy seat. See? Now, it's right up there in the upper regions of the fallopian tubes that that seed of the male unites with the ovum or the seed of the woman. And when they come together, you see, that's when life begins, you see? That's what we call conception, you see? And whether you realize it or not, see, conception can take place, see, up here in your brain, see, court roundabout, holy place, most holy place, see? And when you hear something expressed, and you understand that thing, and what do you say? I see. That's when you conceive of that that the speaker is talking about. So that's when conception takes place. You see? That don't appear in your brain. You see? Now after that seed unites, then it begins a journey down out of the fallopian tubes. See? And comes on down into the womb. You see? You understand? Now to, to satisfy the dictates of the pattern, see? Then that child must tarry there in the womb for what? 40 weeks. And every mother that ever had a baby, she, she knows she can't ha lay with her husband tonight and have a baby tomorrow. No. You see? And sometimes you get awfully fatigued and tired carrying that child around, you see, in your womb. But it must stay there for 40 weeks, 280 days, nine calendar months or 10 lunar months. You see, to satisfy the requirements of that 40 there in the holy place of your tabernacle pattern. You understand? See? And while it's in there like that, see? Go back here to the, mo to the, migra uh, the migratory uh, plate, see? Migra migratory pattern. See? When the children of Israel were here in the wilderness, weren't they surrounded by water? Here, there's the Red Sea, and here's the... Jordan River, so they're surrounded by water, you see? So, can you see why the baby in the womb is surrounded by water, see? Here he is, see? All surrounded by water, you see? Understand? Now, the children of Israel, while they were in the wilderness, weren't they fed manna from heaven? You understand? See? So the baby in the womb is fed substance, see, through this placenta that overhangs his head, see? And it's not pork chops and candy jams that the mother eats, you understand? It is a heavenly food, in other words, you see? Coming from this placenta-like growth, which represents the cloud, that hung over the children of Israel out here in the wilderness. That's where they received that sustenance from heaven. That matter from heaven came by way of that cloud. See? So the baby in the womb, see, he has his nutrition coming down from that afterbirth, you see, through his umbilical cord on into his body. You see? And doesn't he wander around in that womb, twisting and turning? Why? Because the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness. You understand? See? And I understand through my reading in the Bible there that they did a whole lot of kicking there in the, womb, in the wilderness of Sinai. Is that right? Yeah. They kicked against Moses and Aaron. Said, you brought us out here in this wilderness to kill us off out here in the wilderness. Would that we had stayed down in Egypt? See? where we had lentils and cucumbers to the field, lying like a dog, you understand? You see? That's right, that's characteristic of that old negative spirit, you see? See? We've been better off down there. And Freywell was down there dusting their hind parts, <laughs> you know, day in and day out, see? See? But nevertheless, they did a lot of kicking, see? There in the, the wilderness of Sinai, see? Now the baby in the womb, Ask any mother that has had, that had one. Doesn't the baby do a lot of kicking while he's in the womb? You understand? See? Now, likewise, they did a lot of crying there in the womb. Is that right? You see? 
The voice of him crying in the wilderness, old John the Baptist out there, you understand? See? Likewise, the baby cries in the womb. See? And such a phenomenon, you see, even the doctors don't understand it yet. You see? Because while the baby's in the womb, he has not yet taken in the first breath of air. You see? And we know that in order to make any kind of utterance, we have to express air out of the lungs over the vocal cords. You see? And have it come out your mouth as an utterance. You understand? But here is a baby in the womb has not yet taken in a breath of air. You see? And here he is making signs, you see, while he's yet in his mother's womb. See? We had a case back there in Cincinnati, Jerry Kennedy, you see, where people were coming from all around, see, to listen to the sounds that were emanating from this woman's womb who was pregnant. See? And listen, you had to get down there and put your uh, uh, ear to her belly to hear those sounds either. You could hear them, you know, just being close to her, see? But that phenomenon is manifested in order to prove the fact that these people did do a lot of crying in the womb. You understand? And listen, you are supposed to stand in the holy place. Is that right? Have I heard any crying out of any of you? <laughs> As you stand in the holy place? Yes, indeed. You understand? See? But getting on back to my cardinal point, see? When it came time, see, for that baby to be delivered, now look at the tabernacle pattern. See that door there? You see? That baby's head has to come on down through that pelvic outlet. That's what we call the cervix, you see, or the mouth of the womb. Oh, my goodness. Bring that blackboard up here, and I'll get to that in a minute, see? Now, that's the mouth of the womb there that that baby has to come out of, see? And when that baby's head penetrates that opening of the womb, see, then you see that labor there that contained water, see? There must be some water manifested during the birthing of a child, you see? So then one of the first signs that a mother's about ready to deliver is a bursting of the bag of waters. Is that right, mother? You understand? Then as that head proceeds on down, see? When you get to the altar, blood has to be manifested, you see? So the next thing that you look for is a show of blood. You understand? And then finally, as that baby's head comes on out through the pelvic outlet, you see, then he's born into the world, see, and the doctor slaps him on the behind and he <gasps> takes in a breath of air, you see, see. And when he takes in that air, see, see, he takes on that name, you see. You understand? Would you think the Creator would make something and then not identify the fact that he made it? You understand? Man makes things, and as soon as he gets through it, he puts his name on it. Ford made a car, he put the name Ford on it. He don't want Chevrolet to take credit for it. You understand? And so forth and so on, see? So 150th division of Psalms in the sixth verse. See? So then when the Creator made a man, see, in his likeness and his image, he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and he became a living soul, you see? And I like that expression that he became a living soul because most of us, we are unacquainted with the soul, see? And I'd have you to know it doesn't say that he became a living man. Get the difference? He didn't breathe in his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living man or a living human being. He became a living soul, see? What you and I are in the eyesight of Yahweh is a soul. What's the difference? The Yahweh doesn't have no regard unto your flesh. He has a regard unto your inner man. You see, it's the inner man that is your soul. And that's what he's saving or losing. You see, that inner man is what's going to be saved and enjoy eternal life. Or it's going to be lost and enjoy or suffer eternal damnation. That's the soul. The soul that sinneth shall die. And the soul that doeth righteous, righteousness or righteously shall live. You see? So he was made a living soul. See? And you ought to think of yourselves as souls rather than as human beings. See? 
word human came came from the word humus anyway, which means saw. See? You are of the dust of the earth, see? And all you telling me when you say, Well, I'm a human being. <laughs> see, all you're telling me is that you're made of the dust of the earth, you see. See? Humus is saw, see? See? Read. Psalms hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. verse six. Let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh. Oh, get, oh we get, get the understanding, you see. With all you're getting, get understanding. When Yahweh says back here, it says, let, you see, the waters above be divided from the waters of the knee. Let there be light. Every time he says let, then the sign followed. Is that right? See, in other words, something happened. See? And when Yahweh said, let everything that has breath, see, you're not going to be able to say, well, I ain't going to do it, or what have you. No, he said, let, and that means you must. The sign is following, see. Let everything that has breath, read. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh, you understand? So every time we breathe, we are uttering his name. You breathe in and you're saying Yah, and you breathe out, you're saying way. You got the I can't help it. You understand? If you want to live, you're going to speak his name. See? Like this. Yah, way, Yah, way, Yah, way. See? Everybody. See? And even though you don't know that the name is Yahweh, you're still saying Yahweh. See? You understand? Like we were out there in those churches, we said, hallelujah. Yah is a short form for Yahweh. Mm -hmm. See? And by the way, it's spelled J-A-H. Hallelujah. J-A-H. And the con correct pronunciation would be hallelujah. The J has a J sound to it. You understand? But instead of saying hallelujah, we say hallelujah. You see, that all let you know it can't be Jehovah. <laughs> see, yeah, you see, it's Yahweh. That's right. You understand? See, but here we go along, ignorant. See, we say Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Right. <laughs> In our ignorance, you understand? Yeah. See, but let everything that has breath read. Let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. And Yahweh is getting himself glory, mm -hmm. you see. And we are praising him without even recognizing him, see. Because every, every time we breathe, Yahweh, Yahweh. Praising Yahweh day in and day out, even while you sleep. How many of you stop breathing when you sleep? Hopefully you don't, you understand? Because if you did, you wake up and find yourself dead, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> see? So let everything that has breath pray Yahweh. You see? Now you're doing that, see? See? But I'm trying to show you how even in your physical body these signs are manifested. The blood, see? Show of blood at the delivery. The water, the bag of water is bursting. And the baby taking in the breath of air, which is synonymous to spirit. Blood, water, spirit is manifested right within you. You understand? And in every way, you are manifesting this pattern. See? Now, I had them bring that blackboard up on the uh, floor here because I want you to see something about that word cervix. See? Now, this is the way it's spelled. Many of you have seen this. That's the mouth of the womb through which the baby comes. It is right here. You see, here's the womb, this is the mouth. That thing has to stretch or dilate when the baby is being born into the world. Mm -hmm. That's the point at which he's being delivered. You understand? Now, the children of Israel were down here in Egypt, and they are being delivered also, see? Now, in order for them to be delivered, they had to offer up that lamb, you see, and then have that lamb roasted, and then they had to partake of that lamb so that, that lamb was in them. You understand? And that's such a significant point, people. That's what Dr. Gary Mathis was trying to get across to you. If you see where these people could only be delivered out of this bondage down in Egypt 
by partaking of that lamb and having that lamb in them, you ought to know, since that is a type and a shadow of your spiritual and psychological bondage, you see, that you are in out here in these churches, and the only way you're going to be delivered out of that is to have Yahshua the Messiah, who is the Lamb of Yahweh, you see. You're going to have to have him in your heart and in your mind. You're going to have to partake of him. He can't be off above the sun, moon, and stars. He's got to be in you. Yahshua the Messiah in you. And I have you know why I'm right here now, because Gary was on that too. Some of us are out here talking about Yahweh, you see, in you. I beg to differ with you. You're going to have to differentiate between Yahweh as pure spirit and Yahweh out of him. That Kenny said, Yahweh didn't die for you. And no blood in that at all. No blood in this. But the blood was in this sacrificial lamb here. See? And I'd have you know that Yahweh is not jealous of his son. If you give the credit unto Yahshua, Yahweh is pleased with that. See? Now you don't have to come up here talking about Yahweh in you, the hope of glory. It's not Yahweh in you. Paul knew what he's talking about with the Holy Spirit in him. He said, Yahshua the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. You understand? See? That's some of the deception that we have to be uh, aware of that's coming to us while we are yet in this school. You understand? See? And don't you think the devil is 9,000 miles away from us over there sitting on, uh, in, up in the Vatican? I'd have you know that he's come right on up into the congregation now, and he's trying to deceive right among our ranks. Right. You're going to have to be aware more and more, right. you see, of that deceptive nature, see? Because all of us now have been taught these things. You understand? And we've learned them. We've gotten around to the place now almost anybody can get up on the floor and go through this charts and what have you. Mm -hmm. Paul put it like this in the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He said, brethren, see, that we all have knowledge. Read it from somebody for me. 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. First then I'll make a point and go along. 1 Corinthians 8 and 1. Read. Now as touching things of offered unto idols, Read. we know that we all have knowledge. Now we know that we all have knowledge. And everybody in here now understands, see, how this, how this thing goes. See? And through such knowledge, you see, some of us have been come puffed up with it. Well, that's what Paul is talking about. Right. Read. Knowledge puffeth up. But knowledge puffeth up. But love. And let, let me just deal with that a little bit. See? Mm -hmm. you, get, you come down here to this school and you learn things that you know yourself. You never knew before you came down here. And things that are astound the world out there. The people that have the education out there in the world. The PhDs, the things that we speak of down here in the school, make them look like Ned and the first reader. You understand? See? Now, what's going to keep you from becoming all elated and inflated in yourself, you see, with thinking that you could confound some of these college professors or what have you, and these uh, 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 studious-minded people out there in the world? See? You're going to have to guard against becoming over exalted in yourself through the manifestation of things that you learned down here in this school. Because the devil will take advantage of you at every, at every turn, see? And make you think that you're something great, mm -hmm. you see? Because you know a few things since you come in this school. And Paul is saying here now, read. Now as touching things offered unto idols, mm -hmm. we know that we all have knowledge. We know that we all have knowledge. Read. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. But love edifies. But love edifies, see? And Yahshua the side, see, he is love. God is love, see? Yahshua is love, see? And the way he did to show manifest his love, he condescended. He didn't exalt himself. He condescended. He made himself abased. He came on down, you see? In order to, uh, Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you see? So in order for us to demonstrate that same love, we're going to have to come on down, you see? and just break this thing down and get it known unto uh, mankind, see? Now, the time that they were delivered, you see, down here, was the 14th of Adib or Nison. I heard it, mm -hmm. see? <laughs> yeah, I've been listening for it. I had my ear cocked to it, you understand? See, 14th of the night. Now, they were told that that was a night to always be remembered, you see? Understand? When they were delivered, see? 
Now, in order that you would remember your night of being delivered, you see, then Yahweh has caused the doctors to call that little opening there through which a man has to come when he's born into the world. He's had to call that a cervix, you see, in order to denote that time that they were delivered, see. Now, they were told to recon recollect, that means to remember, see. Now, we are told in this school that everything that you have, you have to turn it around, you see, the other way, you see. In other words, it's just physical, you have to flip it over into the spirit, turn it around, you see. So when you turn this word around, see, you get X, I, D, R, E, C, see. Now, what does this mean in Roman numerals? 14. See? And recollect means to remember, you see? So Yahweh has just put it right on you. Remember, see, the 14th. You see? See? You understand? And we all should keep in mind, see, that we have been, deliver been delivered from death unto life through the preaching of of this teaching, see? And it would just be a wonderful thing if we could demonstrate and show our appreciation to our Heavenly Father, see? Not just through lip service and say, well, I thank you and so forth and so on, see? Words will not suffice to show forth of your thankfulness to the Father, you see? The way that you demonstrate your thankfulness to the Father is through, through what Dr. Mathis already said. In an example of Yahshua the Messiah, see, walking around in these fleshly bodies, 14th chapter of John, which I called, uh, 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 made mention of in my remarks in your program, see, that the place that the Savior had prepared for us was the place that he was in when he was walking around in the flesh. You understand? He knew his father's business. You understand? What son is it doesn't know his father's business? You see? He knew his father's business. He knew that he had to take off that flesh and he didn't have no fear of dying. See? Because he told his disciples, I'll see you again. You see? And he knew that he would be glorified with the Father, you see, in the kingdom, see? And he also knew that he had to suffer unto death, you see, out there on the cross, see? Now, if we are in the same place that he was in when he was walking around in the flesh, you see, then we can appreciate the fact that we must undergo some suffering and some affliction, you see, while we are yet tabernacle in this... And let me tell you one other thing. See, he received that at the hands of his own brethren. You see? Now, where is our persecution going to come from and our affliction? Right from among our own brethren. brethren. Why are we so surprised when we get opposition from those that are among us? Where do you expect it, expect it to come from? I told you that the Pope is 9,000 miles away over there in Rome. He ain't bothering none of you. You understand? And the opposition that you're going to get is going to come right from on you. Judas was one of the brethren that was tabernacling around with him in the flesh. He said, my own familiar friend has lifted up his heel against you. See? So those that are going to persecute you are going to come right from among your own ranks. You see? But if you understand, see, the place that you are in, see, then you won't be overcome by that, you see. And the, you'll go ahead and demonstrate that Yahshua spirit in you by the way that you walk and the way that you talk. You understand? And that would be the way in which you will show your thankfulness to the Creator by having called you into this knowledge and understanding. Thank you very much for your attentiveness. <laughs> We'll have more.